I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. My topic today is What is Love? Subtitled, The Opposite of What You Think It Is. So let's start with the rom-com version. There is one girl, seemingly only one girl in the town, in the world, and she seems ordinary on the outside and adorably imperfect. But something is so special about her that men are vying for her attention, looking at at least two of them saying, how much can we sacrifice for this woman? Let me give up my ego, my high-powered career. Let me see how much wealth I can throw at her. I can give up my own safety because she is the one I want. But she's the one who makes the ultimate sacrifice because she chooses between them. For the long version of this formula, I recommend Natalie Wynn on ContraPoints dissecting the series Twilight. But there are many examples. So romance is exclusivity. It is the starborn lover the one who is meant for you from the beginning of time. It is judging and discriminating and finding the one. I'm going to argue that love is the opposite, that it is inclusive or it isn't love, that it is totally indiscriminate, that it is the spiritual slut. Let's do this. I think it's appropriate that that motorcycle was revving on the word spiritual slut, don't you? So love is not an active state. It actually is passive. It is our default. It's a place of non-judging and only giving what it is that you can give to everyone. What are those things? What you can give to everyone is the benefit of the doubt that what they're doing is exactly what you'd be doing in their circumstances. You can also give your ideas to everyone, and you can give everyone your well wishes. We think that love is something that requires us to give up, and giving up is a scary thing, and it makes us feel guilty if we're not giving up what it is that someone else needs. But there's a way in which feeling responsible for someone else's needs is a way that we're not giving them credit for being able to take care of themselves. We're not giving them the same concept that they, like us, are an idea of God and an idea of God that is expressing itself in a way that we all can do. Love is non-judgment, which is beginner's mind. It's newborn mind. But it's not just you who are newborn, who are saying, I have no basis on which to judge this. But it's also letting that person be newborn, releasing them from their past. When you feel like you need to take responsibility for other people, it puts you in a place of judgment. You say, oh, If I need to sacrifice, I need to make sure that this person deserves it. Once you let go of the idea of sacrifice, which is not love, then you don't have to judge them. You don't have to bring all of the ego and everything that you've learned to that situation. You can let them be who they are going into the future. Fear, guilt, and blame are what I call the unholy trinity, and I spell holy and unholy with a W. Whenever you are blaming someone else, it's always going to cause you to experience guilt because in your mind, you know that you've made yourself better than them. And then it's going to cause you to fear them because you're going to fear retaliation and judgment on you. And that judgment on you also leads to guilt. And that guilt is something that then you want to displace and put on someone else, and that leads to blame. So these things all circle around. What A Course in Miracles says, which I'll be quoting from in a minute, 
is that everything that isn't love is fear. There isn't love and hate. The dichotomy is love and its absence, which is fear. So take away the fear and you're always going to lead towards love. On the other hand, is that any time that you can love and give someone that benefit of the doubt, what I see as forgiveness, giving forward that belief in yourself and putting that to someone else, that's always going to lead to you not being afraid. And I think that's the miracle. And the last point I'll make is guard your loneliness like a dragon's treasure. The internet is a repository of loneliness. Of course it is, because if any of us were actually getting our needs met in our day-to-day life, we wouldn't be driving so hard to be able to communicate, to be able to make connections with other people who actually get what we're saying. And that's a beautiful thing. I don't know which to talk about as the real world. Is the real world the one in which you go through the roles that you have in your day-to-day life? Or is the real world the one where you find that mind-to-mind connection? And that's something that you can give freely. It's not something where you need to be special. In a way, you're giving it to everyone, and you're willing to receive it from anyone who is able to make that connection. So treasure your loneliness. It is the part of you that is able to shine into the rest of the world and find those dark corners in anyone else. This is the important part of us. I'll end with a reading from A Course in Miracles, Chapter 15, The Holy Instant, Part 5, Special Relationships. And I change some of the spelling and pronunciation and also make the language more gender neutral, actually gender balanced. I haven't gone as far as calling the Christ Krista, but it only makes sense to me that if we see God as masculine— and I think we should, that then the inclusive self that is part with him, that is God's love embodied, needs to be feminine. So here we go. One, the holy instant is the Holy Spirit's most useful learning device for teaching you love's meaning. For its purpose is to suspend judgment entirely, Judgment always rests on the past, for past experience is the basis on which you judge. Judgment becomes impossible without the past, for without it you do not understand anything. You would make no attempt to judge, because it would be quite apparent to you that you do not understand what anything means. You are afraid of this, because you believe that without the ego— all would be chaos. Yet I assure you that without the ego, all would be love. Three, you cannot love parts of reality and understand what love means. If you would love unlike to God, who knows no special love, how can you understand it? To believe that special relationships with special love can offer you salvation is the belief that separation is salvation, for it is the complete equality of the at one in which salvation lies. How can you decide that special aspects of the oneship can give you more than others? The past has taught you this, yet the holy instant teaches you it is not so. 8. Everyone on earth has formed special relationships, and although this is not so in heaven, the Holy Spirit knows how to bring a touch of heaven to them here. In the holy instant, no one is special, for your personal needs intrude on no one to make your other selves seem different. In the holy instant, you see in each relationship what it will be 
when you perceive only the present. 10. The meaning of love is the meaning God gave to it. Give to it any meaning apart from his, and it is impossible to understand it. God loves every other self as he loves you, neither less nor more. He needs them all equally, and so do you. In time, you have been told to offer miracles as I direct, and let the Holy Spirit bring to you those who are seeking you. Yet in the holy instant, you unite directly with God, and all your other selves join as Christ with you. Those who are joined as Christ are in no way separate. For Christ is the self the at one shares, as God shares his self with Christ. 11. Think you that you can judge the self of God? God had created it beyond judgment, out of his need to extend his love. With love in you, you have no need except to extend it. In the holy instant, there is no conflict of needs for there is only one. For the holy instant reaches into eternity and to the mind of God, and it is only there love has meaning, and only there can it be understood. And to follow up, here is spiritual optimism and political radicalism on Marianne Williamson, and this is the whole Course in Miracles playlist that starts with, And the Flesh Was Made Word. Thank you for watching.